Hello? This is chapter 3, working with financial statements. So chapter 3 show how to use the financial statements that we learned in, in the previous chapter. The previous chapter we learned how to build the statements. Now this chapter learns, teaches like how to use them. So let's look at them. So for example, mm, suppose there are two companies, company A and B. Oh, sorry. A and B and say net income is the A net income is hundred dollars B net income is thousand dollars okay. in dollar term now because the net income of B is greater than net income of A sounds like it's, it's better like it, it looks like it's better however if the asset size, so total asset is say this hundred dollar company total asset is like thousand dollars, and B company the total asset is say hundred thousand dollars. Now, if you normalize the firm because the smaller firm generates smaller net income, larger firm generate larger net income. Now. If you divide, like net income divided by total asset, then this is 10% A and B is 1%, right? This is greater. So which one is more important? Well, when you compare, which one is more accurate? We believe that now we have to standardize these numbers using the sum percentage. This is called like the this this is ROA actually. We're gonna learn that later. And one way to measure the performance. And we usually um, the answer that uh, the performance of A is greater than performance B. Since the ROA of A is greater than ROA B. So that's the ratio analysis. That's the ratio. Instead of just dollar amount, we look at the ratio. It can be used both internally and externally. So for internally, we can use it like uh, comparing with other departments, say iPhone versus I iPad department in Apple. You can compare the performance or others. Or throughout the year, so last year, I was like I want to compare current year, this year's performance with like five years, last year average. So that we, we want to know the current status of the firm. It also can be used uh, with, for externally such as the, you can compare with competitors, you know, you can set a benchmark and the industry average and compare with them and if it performs better and you alpha firm, if it performs worse and it's underperformed, such, you know, and so on. So for each ratio, you have two questions to ask. One is the what the ratio is trying to measure, so the meaning of the ratio, first of all. And the second one is why it is important. So let's look at that. There are five different types of ratio. This is not really um, definitive because this is one way to categorize the ratio. Some other textbook probably use a different uh, categories, but um, this is a good category. Um, and we're gonna look at it one by one. Liquidity ratio, financial leverage ratio, and asset management ratio, profitability ratio, and market value ratio. Let's look at one by one. By the way, this is a table. You probably have one in the textbook too. This is old version of textbook, so I don't know if it's uh, really um, exactly um, match it, but, but you should have one like that. This is common financial ratio based on the categories. And there are a bunch of ratios here. Some student, oh, many students actually worry about that because uh, these are the ones that you probably memorize. However, this class uh, does not, uh, you need. You don't need to really memorize because everything, you can find it, you can open book, open notes exam. So you don't have to worry about it, but at least you have to know which ratios are in what categories and what's the meaning of that. So number one, liquidity ratio. What is it? It's the liquidity. That's the 
good question, right? And I think the chapter two has some, you know, concept. We learn some concept of the liquidity. Liquidity is so if you can convert the asset into cash without losing value, the assets are liquid. So a company may be liquid if they can cover their liability, like current liability, using the liquid asset, enough liquid asset. They should have enough liquid asset to cover the short-term liabilities. So for example, you have very good operation, your net income is good, you know, you have, you know, fairly amount, like a large amount of the assets so that you can sell it out if you have trouble. However, if you don't have enough current assets, so enough liquid assets, and you have a lot of bills coming in, then you need to sell something like fixed asset, illiquid asset, you lose a lot of value. So you will have liquidity problem. That's called liquidity problem. So the liquidity problem occurs if you cannot cover the short-term liability so you should have enough current asset, the liquid asset, to cover the short-term liabilities. So if you look at this balance sheet, you know, the current asset part is here, cash, account receivables, and inventory. And the current liability part is here. So you basically have the liability within a year to pay back about $540 million. And you have $708 million for current assets, so you have um, more current assets than current liability, usually fine. This is good sign. See? So, one first ratio we're going to see is the current ratio, basically current asset divided by current liability. So, current asset $708, current liability $540 million. You have 1.31 times as much current asset as much as current liability. So you have more current asset than current liability. You want to have the current ratio greater than one. If not, you may have liquidity problem. Now liquidity problem sometimes very critical since you know, even though you have good operations, you are going to be bankrupt if you do not pay back your bill in the short term. So company try to hold enough liquid asset to be safe. So some people can ask, oh, what if you hold everything in cash? That's a good question, right? So that's the one question we can talk in class and uh, what's the benefit of holding cash and what's the problems of holding cash. The next ratio is the quick ratio. The quick ratio, now, if you look at the current asset, the cash and the current receivables and other securities like such as very short-term securities, usually very easy to convert to cash. The cash is just cash. Car receivable usually can be collected, you know, within 30 days, and the, the market of securities is easily sold in the market. However, the inventory, inventory is a little different. Some inventories you can, you have to hold it for a long time. If you have to liquidate your inventory, you may lose your value. You know, think about the car dealership. You know, they usually provide a deep discount for the car like last year models because uh, they want to liquidate them. So some people argue that oh, inventory is not liquid enough to be categorized or to cover the liability to be safe. So a more conservative way to look at the liquidity is the quick ratio. Simply you subtract inventory from the current asset as a numerator and the current liability as a denominator. So it can be called acid it is called acid test and this case is 0 0.53 times because uh, your inventory is 422 million dollars. 
It doesn't have to be greater than one, but you can compare with other competitors, you know, see if you have enough, enough really liquid asset other than inventory. Okay. The last one is the cash ratio. Now, some people say, well, the most important and most liquid asset to avoid the liquid problem is cash. So you want to see the cash versus the current liabilities. This company has the 0.18 times cash ratio. We don't know if it is good or bad because we don't have any benchmark. So compare with others, if the healthy firm holds like the more cash, then you may have to think about holding more cash or vice versa. So that's the liquidity ratio. Again, the liquidity has to be, uh, is important, important to run a business. The next one is the financial leverage ratio. Now there's a concept called the leverage. Leverage means Leverage is the amount of the debt relative to your assets. And same as relative to your equity, right? Since total asset equals total debt plus total equity, right? So how much debt you hold relative to your assets? That's the leverage. Now we are going to learn the capital structure theory, theory, you know, so how much portion of the debt is good, how much portion of the equity good. But at least we have to know that because debt car carries the legal obligation called the interest and repayment, and if you do not follow them, you are at default. Holding more than usually lead the riskiness, the increase in the risk of the firm. So if that increase, then usually firm more risky. Again, some people can argue, well, let's eliminate all debts, let's make all equity firms, which is uh, uh, the case of some companies, all equity companies, without that, but there is a reason why we also have hold some debts. Mostly that is cheaper way to finance than equity. So even we hold some risk risk to hold the debt and we want to uh, lower the cost of the cost of finance. However, if you hold too much debt then you your probability, the possibility to be default increases, so your firm face a risk in this problem. Too much risk. To measure that, we have several ratios. Those ratios are basically exactly the same ratio, actually. The number is different, but meaning is the same. So, the first one is the total debt ratio. It's basically total debt divided by total asset. And it's the same as Total asset minus total equity divided by total asset. So how much did you have relative to your assets? For this company, it's 0.28 times. Again, we don't know if it is good or bad. Depends on industry, depends on time, so you need to have benchmark to compare. The second ratio is the debt to equity ratio. Now, instead of the as, uh, asset, you want to measure the amount of debt relative to the total equity. Because total asset equal total debt plus total equity, you can actually convert this ratio into the other pretty quite easily. And debt to equity ratio again if the if you hold more debt then debt to equity ratio higher because total debt is higher. Now the last one is equity multiplier. So instead of using the debt, you make the total equity as a denominator. So if you hold more debt than your denominator actually decrease, so your equity multiply increase, so total asset divided by total equity. This is same as just one plus debt to equity because total asset divided by total equity equals to 
total depth plus total equity divided by total equity, right? So it's going to be 1 plus depth to equity ratio. So if your depth to equity ratio higher, obviously equity multiplier is higher. So this measures the amount of the debt. Now next one is another financial leverage ratio. It's a little different meaning. The previous one, the meaning is the amount of debt to measure the risk. Now you have some, you know, more stuff than you have to think about. So, if you have too much debt, you may have more interest to be paid back, right? And if you your operation is fine, so if your business is fine, if you generate enough sales, enough income to cover this interest, usually fine. So if you have hundred dollars interest to, to uh, need to pay back, and if you generate like five hundred dollars income, then you can simply pay back. You still make money. However, sometimes if you have trouble in your operation. So you don't make enough money to cover your interest, that's a big problem. That's called a solvency problem, sometimes long-term solvency problem. So this ratio measures the solvency of the firm. So let's look at it. Times interest earned is EBIT, EBIT divided by interest. So it's before interest and taxes money. Then but you, you, you need to have enough EBIT to pay your interest. If not, then you will have negative taxable income and negative net income. You lose your money. It means that you have trouble in your operations. It's a little different problem comparing with the liquidity problem because now liquidity problem may occur even though your operation is fine. So if you, if somebody else like such as the creditors or the government even government inject the cash into those companies then usually we can resolve the problem now if you face a solvency problem however it means that you have trouble you ha your operation is trouble you don't make enough money you don't you don't sell enough products so and you have problem with your cost of structure too so you your company needs to be restructured so that's the case of the auto companies in 2008 you know a lot of financial institutions actually receive cash from government to resolve the liquidity issue however those three companies 3M, Ford, you know Chrysler receive the cash to resolve short-term you know the liquidity problem but still remain it's the problem because uh, they have trouble in selling their cars they have trouble in you know reducing their costs so they shut down the factories they actually lay up the people they you know reduce the brand and restructure the firms because they had solvency problem they have long-term solvency problem they cannot make enough money to cover the interest so here, the times interest earned, this company sounds like it, it looks pretty healthy because uh, they make 4.9 times, you know, EBIT, EBIT you know, to, uh, versus, you know, comparing with the amount of interest. Now, some people may argue that, well, you know, remember the last class, you know, the depreciation. The depreciation is non-cash item. When, but when you comp compute the EBIT, that's after depreciation money. So the if the amount of depreciation is too large, then your ability to be pay interest, you know, may be under underestimated, right? So I mean, we we really need enough cash to cover the interest. So you add back the depreciation non-cash item. Your numerator may be greater because you have that much, that much cash to cover the interest, which is called the cash coverage ratio. The next ratio is asset management ratios. This measures the efficiency of the operation. Okay. So how efficiently 
we use the asset, the firm uses the asset. First one is the inventory ratio. It measures how efficiently the firm sells out the inventory. You know, if you hold inventory too long, what happens? Your cost, holding cost, you know, too large. However, so to reduce the inventory cost, if you, if you want, so you just reduce the the, the amount of inventory, then you may face a shortage problem. Shortage problem sometimes more serious than the holding inventory too long because the shortage means your customer may leave because you, you have to make your customer wait for a long time and you, may, you, you actually lose a lot of values. So they need to have sort of the effective number of days to hold the inventories. And that's how to compute the days of inventory, like holding inventories. The first ratio is the inventory turnover. It's basically COGS, cost of goods sold, divided by inventories. It means that, so suppose, uh, it means that you, if you sell out inventory more quickly, then your the amount of inventory will be decrease relative to your your cost of goods sold, right? So inventory turnover will be increase. So higher inventory turnover means that you have you you hold inventory shorter, so like shorter period. So you may effect more effectively sell out your inventory. In this case, the 3.2 times. Now, if you just uh, see the 3.2 times, it's not easy to un intuitively understand. So we can convert this to more intuitively, easily understandable ratio, like a, in terms of number of days to sell out the inventory, which is called the days sales in inventory. Simply 365, which is the number of days a year, divided by inventory turnover. So it's going to be 365 divided by 3.2, which is 114 days. So it means that you hold this inventory for, so on average, this is average number, on average, you hold the inventory for 114 days. Now the next one is the receivable ratio. The receivable ratios is how effectively you collect the cash. That's the question. If you have trouble in collecting cash, what happened? You have because you know even though you sell a lot of goods, a lot of products, your revenue is high. However, you only hold the receivables and it goes to bad receivables, collection problem, your customer don't pay back, <coughs> then it's not selling, right? So we want to reduce the number of days in collecting cash. This, so the receivable turnover is simply the sales divided by account receivable. Now, if you collect cash more quickly it means that your amount, the amount of account receivable relative to cash decrease so receivable turnover will increase so higher receivable turnover ratio means that you are more effectively more quickly to collect the cash this company 12.3 times again however it's not easy to understand so we convert into number of days in receivable which means that this is average number of days in collecting cash from sales so it's called the day sales in receivable simply 365 divided by receivable turnover so this case 30 days so it means that on average on average it take 30 days to collect cash after the after the sales so your cash cycle is like this. You purchase inventory, right? So you buy inventory. 
and you pay cash. And your sales made, and you collect cash. Okay. So the previous days, uh, the ratio, day sales and inventory measure the duration between the purchase inventory to sales made. How long does it take? to sell out the inventory from the purchasing date 114 days here, right? and then they sell the receivables measure the duration between sales and collecting cash which is 30 days here so on average on average this company from purchase inventory to collecting cash it takes 144 days okay so that's one cycle from purchasing inventory to collect cash in fact because your sales and COGS actually recorded this timing you may have some short-term financing issues here because you pay cash before you collect it. So that's why you need to have the short-term financing problem, short-term financing issues. Now the third asset management ratio is asset turnover ratio. Now you, we want to measure how effectively, how effective you use the asset to generate the sales. So total asset turnover means that now if you use more effectively what happens you basically sell more with same amount of the asset right so your total asset turnover increase the total the higher total asset turnover means you use asset more effectively capital intensity ratio is simply 1 over total asset turnover so the meaning is opposite lower capital inten in intensity ratio is more effective use of asset profitability measures now that we want to measure the performance that's the profitability when you measure the profitability, we usually have several ways. One way is we want to measure the income, the net profit versus the, the sales, which is called the profit margin. Sometimes it's called net profit margin. So this is net income versus sales. This measures actually the the effectiveness of the cost. So if you use too much expense, the cost, then your profit margin decreases, right? So we need to, we want to reduce the cost. We want to uh, have the cost low enough to have good profit, profit margin. The next two ratios about the relative to the size of the firm. Sales may be the good representation of the size, but it's, it's, it's not everything. The profit margin more focused on the cost itself. The return on asset now is relative to the size. So the denominator is the total asset. If the size is bigger, you have to generate more net income. That's called the return on assets, which is called ROA, very famous. This from 10.12 percent ROA. Now the next one is well, how about this? We are more interested in maximizing the owner's wealth, so let's eliminate the debt portion because that portion is not owner's money. Let's only consider the owner's money, which is the total equity. So net income divided by total equity is called the return on equity. 
is more effective way to measure the returns relative to the amount the, the for, I mean relative to the owner's money the shareholders money. the last one is the market value measure now we learn the difference between book value and the market value so market value is the value in the market especially for the stock market probably important for the firm if the firm is publicized so if the market price is $88 per share, that's the basically the stock price in the market. And stock price represents the value in the market, current value in the market. And if the number of shares outstanding is $33 million, now your earnings per share is your net income, it's also called the EPS, is your net income divided by number of shares outstanding so it measures the amount of income per share so for this company net income is 363 million dollars in the previous net uh, income statement and the number of shares outstanding 33 million so 11 dollars earnings per share eps okay now the next one is the pe ratio we also call it per PR and this is very popular ratios in stock analysts like it's for stock analysts and PE ratio is important is PPS the per price per share divided by EPS so this company price per share is 88 bucks EPS $11 so 8 times per what does it mean it means that the company makes like the, the market price of the firm is 8 times relative to the earnings per share so if so if this is very good way to compare like uh, to see if this this firm is overpriced or this stock is overpriced or underpriced so if per is too high say 11 times comparing with others so mostly this industry the per should be eight times but now it's 11 times it means that your price is too high it's overpriced stock so you have to sell it. If per is too low, say it's fifty-five dollars per share, it's five times. But mostly, this type of firm has eight times. <coughs> Excuse me. Then it's underpriced that you have to buy it. So that's the P ratio is very commonly used in stock analy analyzing stock, especially see if this stock is on the overpriced or underpriced the next one is the price to sales ratio is very very similar since sales may be another way to measure the, the performance however per is more uh, useful since even though sales is high your cost has problems so earnings actually is more important than sales itself so price to sales ratio mostly maybe can be uh, measures the, your price relative to the size of the firm maybe or uh, one way to like to measure performance but mostly in the market per is more popular to see now the last one is market the book value ratio you remember what book value is right the book value is the value in the book in the financial statements and the book value of the firm is mostly book value of the equity so this is the price per share divided by book value per share. So total equity divided by shares outstanding. Total equity for this firm is two billion five hundred ninety-one million dollars. Number of outstanding shares outstanding thirty-three million. So your book value per share is seventy-eight dollars fifty-two cents. So market to book value is eighty-eight divided by seventy-eight fifty-two is one point one two times. First of all, the book value represents, so when you uh, record the equity account into your balance sheet, this is basically cost of the equity, cost of the stock. It means that this is the initial price of the stock. If the value of firm increase a lot, so the price increase a lot, then you have high market book ratio. 
so market book ratio usually sometimes represents the firm value itself. If your firm value is high, then your market book value ratio is high. So this is the end of the first clip. We looked at the five different character ratio and we're gonna see some application in the next video clip.